Remnant Boot Camp. Now, over the past nine sessions, we have examined powerful truths from the Word of God. And to be truthful, as I approach this last session, I'm, I'm wondering if I have covered everything properly. Because 1 John is so pivotal to where we're headed. This morning, as I was preparing my notes, I was just kind of praying and saying, Lord, have I made all of the proper emphasis on what the Holy Spirit wanted I asked if I had showed how spiritual weighty the concepts are of who Jesus is, the importance of his commandments, and the real threat the Antichrist spirit is bringing to an unprecedented level in the day. We sang that song this morning, He Who Was, Who Is, and Who Is to Come. How many know Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever? He was Yahweh of the Old Testament, he is Yeshua of the New Testament, and he is coming back as Messiah ben David at the end. Yet the Antichrist can't make that boast because it says he who was, who is not, and yet is to come. It's really a battle between two kingdoms, and we've got to really begin taking a look at ourselves because I think most of the body of Christ we have set here with one foot in one kingdom, one foot in the other kingdom, and I'm, re- I'm getting ready to give you a prophetic word with what's coming. You're going to meet the biggest fence post you ever saw. And God is giving us a clarion call to get into his kingdom and his kingdom alone. It is my prayer that the Holy Spirit would use this series as seeds within your heart and that, and that you would tend the sacred ground of your heart. Because let me tell you something, the most sacred thing you have right now is your heart, the ground of your heart. You need to make sure what's planted there. It's time to pull out the weeds. It's time to get rid of the junk and to make sure that only the engrafted word of God, which is able to save your souls, is planted into the, into the sacred ground of your heart. Now, today I want to look at several things as we finish this up on 1 John. I want to first of all start with 1 John chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. We need to realize there is a sin unto death. And that this is something that has been century-old controversy in the body of Christ going all the way back to the early days of Calvin. It took Calvin to mess it up. It took Arminius to to even make it more convoluted when this little Jewish apostle had a right to begin with in his gospel. It said, if you see a brother, if any, if any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for him that sin not unto death. In other words, if you see a brother sin, you can begin praying and interceding for him. And saying, God, give me the words to take to him that can turn him around and restore him in the faith. Because we all fall into sin from time to time. The enemy loves to sneak up on us. And so he's dealing with that, and he has already established in his writing that that when we sin, that we're not seeking a lifestyle of sin. We're trying to walk with God and walk in his commandments. But that if we sin, we have one that is faithful and just who will forgive us of those sins if we'll simply confess them. And so if you see a brother erring off into sin, you can reach out to him in love. And as you're praying for him, the Holy Spirit begins working on him. At the same time, the Holy Spirit begins depositing with you an anointing. And when he says, go, you go and the two anointings meet and the guy can, be re- and can receive repentance and be brought back into fellowship. That's what he's talking about here. But let's go on to see what he says here. There is a sin unto death, and I do not say that he shall pray for it. So if you see somebody do this, this sin unto death, don't mess with them anymore. It's a waste of your prayer life. Now, that may have rattled some people, so he he goes on to say, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin, or a sin, not unto death. Now, in the Greek, when you look at this, a is not in the original Greek. Because if you put a sin in there like it does in the King James Bible, it's like all these sins will kill you, but maybe there's one that won't. The reality is sin in general won't kill you, but there's one specific one 
that if Satan can embed into your life, it will destroy you. Now, we need to kind of understand how we got where we are because we're looking at American theology, and American theology is once saved, always saved. And I have heard preachers get on, on television and say, I don't care if you commit murder, commit adultery, commit treason, whatever it is. If you went to the altar and you made Jesus Christ Lord and save your life, you're going to end up in heaven. Where do we get that? There was a guy named Calvin, and he had come up with the, the concept that grace is both irresistible, that if you're going to get saved, you can't help but get saved. There are, f- there, are five, there are five divisions of grace, or they call it the, 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 five, the, the, the uh, five leaves on the tulip or whatever it is of Calvinism. And the end one is grace is irrevocable. So if you're going to get saved, God's going to make you get saved. And once you get saved, you can't get out because God's going to make you stay in. It's basically Calvinism. And then there was a, a theologian named Arminius that rose up and said, hey, wait a minute. This is crazy. Calvin, you got it messed up, that we have free will, we have seen free will in the garden, that we have got to respond to the gospel, and if, we, and if we have free will to respond to it, we have free will to fall out of it. And so there has been this dichotomy in Protestant theology of understanding the sovereignty of God and the free will of man and how that works with salvation. And we're trying to figure it out literally as if God thinks in Greco-Roman mindsets. We have forgotten that the entire word of God is written in a Semitic mindset. Mesetic, me, <laughs> Semitic mindsets are block logic. You place them together. And so a rabbi will look at the absolute sovereignty of God and the free will of men, set them side by side, and said, what's the problem? I mean, it would fry Calvin's brain. And a rabbi says, what's the problem? The mystery in between, that's God. If you can figure it all out, you're not dealing with God. But let's, 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 let's bring it down to just where we are here in America. If you refuse to pay your taxes because you don't agree with the current president of the United States, you know that's not going to affect him being president. Eventually, they will come and take, take you away and take away everything you have. Your rebellion against that office and your, refi- and your free will to exercise it in no way threats the sovereignty of that office. In the same way, you can say, I don't have to give to what God belongs to God. I don't have to be obedient to him. That never violates the sovereignty of God because whether you die saved or die or die in sin, you're going to stand before him and be answerable to him. That doesn't move that throne. And so we had this real dichotomy going on. In America, almost all Baptists were Armenianists. That's why they had altar calls. And so Baptists would say that not only can you sin, but you can go so far into sin that you can fall out of sin. And, and, and sometimes in hyper-Armenianism, it's like every time you sin, you, you get lost, and you've got to get born again again. And so then you've got to get born again, 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 again. And that was American Baptist. But over in Europe, they were predominantly Calvinist. We look at Ironside and C.H. Spurgeon. They were all Armenianists or Calvinists, and they would, they would never give an altar call. They, they looked at that and said, well, that's just rude. In fact, Ironside ridiculed Arminius for ever giving, said, how dare you take over the job of the Holy Spirit? Who do you think you are? It is God who saves. And so they were primarily Calvinistic. But there was this Armenianist ba- uh, Baptist pastor named D.L. Moody who went over into, into the UK, and God began to use him for revival, and he ended up becoming good friends with C.H. Spurgeon. And so Moody is the one who genetically spliced those two theologies together. And on one end, it was the free will of man that you, you, give, you give the altar calls, you do all this because it's the free will of man. But then he liked the security of the believer and that the grace is irrevocable once you get in. So he borrowed that from Calvinism and he created a hybrid theology. And that's where we have today the security of the believer. And, we, and you can take it to the place, if you're walking with Jesus and you believe that he is the son of God and that your redemption is through him, you can sin and you can, you can backslide and come back, you can backslide and come back. You're not losing your salvation. You're just like the Jewish people that will go off a whoring and then God would have to redeem them back. But the apostle John is saying there is something 
that you can do. And we've got to realize this. In fact, I've got a great book. Where's it at? Right here. It was written in 95. Just a little book. It's called The Believer's Conditional Security, A Study of Perseverance and the Falling Away. And it takes, it takes us basically back to understanding and separating all the arguments between Calvinism and Arminianism because it's not, it's a Jewish subject. And Jesus over and over again, the Apostle John over and over, he who perseveres to the end shall be saved. It isn't the one who begins the race, it's the one who finishes it. And what begins the race? It's about who Jesus is. That's what we're dealing with here in the book of 1 John. There's a spirit of Antichrist that will use false prophets, false teachings. It will use the spirit of this world. It will use wealth. It will use anything it can to get you off of who Jesus is. If he can get you off of who Jesus is, you are lost. Because it's who he is, not who we are. And it's being in him. But if you deny who he is, then you can't be in him. Because the point of salvation is realizing who he is and how you were undone without him. And we see this, this dichotomy going on in this or the struggle with this within, within early church history. All of us know about the first revolt in 70 AD where the temple was destroyed. But few believers, unless they have studied history or went to Bible college, understand that there was a second revolt around 132, 134, 135 AD. And in the second revolt, there was a rabbi named Rabbi Akiva, who, by the way, also many researchers, including Peter Goodgame, believe he's the one who start, began the very foundational things of Kabbalah because he rejected Jesus as the Messiah. So by doing that, you rejected the Holy Spirit and all the miracles and everything else. He began to draw from esoteric knowledge drawn from Babylon to create a system called Kabbalah, which is a mystical uh, using Babylonian techniques and things to create a false Holy Spirit is my own personal philosophy on that. And I've spoke with some authorities over in Jerusalem and other places, and they all agree with it. Well, if you really distill it down, that's about what it is. But he found this guy whose name was originally Simon ben Kosaba, and he renamed him Simon bar Kochba and declared that he was the Messiah and that he was going to raise up. They insisted on this Messiah ben David instead of understanding that, that Messiah would come as Messiah ben Joseph, first the suffering servant. They were still demanding that conquering king, and they revolted against Rome. Aqaba was killed. Jerusalem, how many know they lost? And this time when the Romans came in, they literally plowed Jerusalem, plowed it under. It didn't even really exist anymore. But there's something strange that went on. All the Messianic community, whether they were Jewish or Gentile said, we cannot raise up and fight because you have designated this man as the Messiah. We remember what John said in the first epistle of John, and we cannot raise up because if we endorse this man as Messiah, we are rejecting Jesus, and we will not do that because that's the spirit of Antichrist. And that was, the, that was the second event that was the major separating, separation of the Jewish community from, from the Messianic community was over who Jesus is. And it's still going on today that there are sections of Messianic Judaism today are ready to deny the divinity of Messiah to get back accepted by Judaism. And let me tell you something. You better not do that because what's getting ready to happen is Israel's getting ready to wake up to who Messiah is and you're going to be standing in a field all by yourself. Now let's connect this with both the book of Hebrews and what Jesus said. Let's look at, at Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. You cannot take this statement without understanding that these people were really saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift. What is the heavenly gift? It's not the Holy Spirit because that's the next phrase. The heavenly gift is salvation. Adoption to the kingdom of God. And we're, ma we're made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the power of, powers of the world to come. How I many know that's miracles, whatever the anointing of the Holy Spirit brings? If they fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they have crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame, it's impossible. You can't do that. They're without hope. 
And what he's dealing with is not that they had pork chops one Saturday afternoon and they're lost without hope, or that they committed a sin. If you want to, what is this book to? This is the book written to the Hebrews. And already by the time that this was written, there were major sections of Judaism that said, listen, if you're going to come back into our fold, Mr. Jew, and be accepted in the synagogue, you have got to deny that Jesus is Messiah. And you've got to say that what he, that on the cross, he got what he deserved because he was a blasphemer. That's what this is dealing with. And they said, listen, if you have been enlightened, told about Messiah, if you have received the gift of salvation, if you have been filled with the Holy Spirit, you've seen the miracles, you've seen all this, and you've understood from the word of God who he is, that if you deny that he's not going to come a second time and deny and, and, and die on the cross for you, that's been done, and you have denied the cross of Christ, you have denied the Messiahship of Jesus, you're without hope. That's the sin unto death. It's not about saying a little lie and getting convicted and later on having to. And I've I've dealt with people that have come up with the most craziest things for the unpardonable sin. Now let's look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 and 32. Because we we need to get this solid in our hearts. Every violation of the Torah, which is what the Bible defines as sin, is forgivable. But you can't deny the very mechanism that God has set into place for the covering of that sin and remain guiltless. Is that making sense this morning? Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 and 32. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world nor in the world to come. That's harsh. And our people say, well, don't speak out against a, a gift of the Holy Spirit because you could blaspheme and lose your salvation. How many know there are some things that people are calling the gifts of the Holy Ghost that are not that need to be spoken out against? There's more being said here than we realize. If Jesus is the Christ, what does Christos mean in Greek? The anointed one. Messiah is the one that the Holy Spirit, Jesus was, was a, a oddity in all of history because men were moved by the Holy Ghost. God would come and, and, and the anointing would, would anoint the prophet, priest, and king. He would come and visit and then pull away. He couldn't stay there. Then all of a sudden there was this man named Jesus. And in 1 John, this is what the Apostle John says about Jesus. And John bore record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, unto whom ye shall see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. The same which is he which baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And this word Greek both, that is both used for abiding upon and remaining on is meno, which means to take up residence. So for the first time in all of human history, the Spirit of God came down and just made his home on Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus is the anointed one. John couldn't make that claim. Elijah couldn't make that claim. Not even Moses could make that claim. Jesus could make that claim because the Holy Spirit came and stayed on him from that moment until he died on the cross when he he gave up his spirit. The Holy Spirit stayed and did not leave him for one millisecond because the Holy Spirit was testifying, this is the Christ, this is the Messiah, and only through his shed blood will all men be saved. So if I blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, what am I doing? 
We see the scribes doing it. I've always wondered what was the the, the catalyst for many of the Jews rejecting Jesus. Yeah, part of it was that he didn't come as Messiah ben David, which was their prophetic preference. And I seal the zeal of their preference, and I wonder how many of us, as we look through this glass darkly and we're looking into prophecy, if God doesn't meet our prophetic expectations, will we miss what he's doing? Okay, you better keep your eyes open and understand what he's doing. In Mark 3, 22, it says, and the, and the scribes came down from Jerusalem, saying, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils cast he out devils. And so they were saying, He is not doing this. The Jesus is not doing this by the Holy Ghost. He's doing it by the spirit of Beelzebub. They just blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Now, what is an interesting thing about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and the second revolt, by the time you get to there, the only, how many know there were three classes of leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees? And it was really the, the Sadducees that, that fell in line with the zealots that caused the, the revolt in 70 AD because for the first time in I don't know however long, they refused to offer a morning sacrifice for the health of Caesar. That's what caused the revolt in 70 AD. And it was primarily the zealots with the scribes and the, and the, and the um, Sadducees that did that. Did you know by the time we get to the second revolt, out of all three groups, the only ones that remained were the Pharisees? They were all killed out. The very ones who denied Christ were all killed out. They were without hope. Why is that so important? Because everything in the world today is trying to either redefine who Jesus is so that he is not the anointed one, but a anointed one. And redefine who he is. We have, we have, I've even looked back and I've been studying Rome here lately. And you know, if you look at the dress of Jesus, it's awful close to a Roman senator in the movies, except he has a purple sash. Why are they dressing him like a Roman? They're not dressing him like a Jew, they're dressing him like a Roman. It shows you how, how far Rome has embedded Every once in a while, you will eventually see Jesus with Zizi. I'm thinking, hey, at least we're getting someplace here. The world is trying to get us to move away from who Jesus really is. And even in the body of Christ, they, they say, now, he's Messiah, but he's, he's the beach Jesus. He's the this Jesus. He's the that Jesus. John said in 1 John, when we see him, we shall be like him. And I think it's not only talking about his second coming. When you see that Jesus was a Torah-observant Jew who was from the direct line on his mother's side, of course, his father's side, he was the king of kings and the lord of lords. He is Elohim come in the flesh on his mama's side. He had a direct line to the throne of David. He is the king of the Jews. He was a Torah-observant Jew that observed it perfectly and was anointed by the God of Israel to be the Messiah. Once you start seeing who he is, the commandments change. You take off your Greco-Roman glasses that were given to us by Constantine that said, let us have nothing in common with the Jews to include the Torah of Moses and all the feasts and everything else. And we, Jesus kept the feasts. Jesus kept Sabbath. Jesus walked all the commandments perfectly. And then, he, then the Bible says, be like him. When you start to see who he is, you can start being like him. It's time that we put on our Jewish glasses and open up the word of God and start seeing who Jesus really is. I've shared this with you before. I've went to large churches. I mean large churches. I've, I've went one church I preached at that was twice the size of the population of this city. And they gasped in astonishment when I told them that Jesus wasn't Baptist. That he was Jewish. 
I actually had one lady after service corner me and said, yeah, but John the Baptist baptized him a Baptist before he started his ministry. (laughs) I went, okay, you didn't hear a thing that I was preaching this morning. But I love it. He, the Apostle John ends this with all righteousness is, all unrighteousness is sin, which is a violation of the commandments. So all righteousness is obedience through the power of the Holy Spirit, the blood of Jesus to the commandments. But he says, and there is sin that's not unto death. So not every sin leads you to death, just this one. So if you backslid and you've fallen away from God, as long as you don't deny who Jesus is, and you work with all your heart to get back right with him and be honest with him, there's hope. But the spirit that is coming on the world today, there is another Messiah that's waiting in the wings to get ready to rise up. And he will be one of the most powerful things. He will be like one of the ancient gods of Rome or Greece. The men of renown of old. That will be like Zeus, Apollos, Hercules that will come. And when he raises up, don't receive him because he is antichrist. He will deny everything that is holy, everything that is right. That's what the first John's all about. And the world is waiting for that. One of the the farmer leaders in the UN said that we're ready. Whether he be, be God or devil, if he can bring peace, we'll follow him. Another main leader at the UN said years ago that this is a Luciferian order, and for you to be a part of what, what they're getting ready to do, you must embrace Luciferian doctrine or you can't be a part of it. Well, I'm sorry, I can't be a part of it. I follow Jesus of Nazareth and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and him alone. And then John begins to share something with us in First John that the world can't get rid of. It's the ultimate witness of God. Because when it's all said and done, how many know when Jesus comes back to the Valley of Armageddon, let me tell you something, the Valley of Armageddon looks different than anything we have ever imagined. It's going to be a cross between Star Wars, Star Trek, Jurassic Park, Clash of the Titans, and everything else. Steven Spielberg or George Lucas couldn't imagine what that thing's going to be like. And when Jesus comes back, he doesn't need to pull out his, his, his phaser out of his pocket. All he has to do is speak a word and they're decimated. And blood will flow through the valley of Armageddon to, up to the horse's uh, bridle on the belly in that entire valley. All he has to do is speak a word and it's all gone. They're going to have their transugenic, superhuman, UFO-empowered Super beings, right? Well, we could have dinosaurs and everything else coming with this ultimate thing of coming against the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And as they open this portal to storm heaven in the Valley of Armageddon, to their dismay as, the, as it begins to open, there's one on a white horse, pokes his head through and says, be gone. And that's the end of the war. Can you imagine? I'm almost getting into my book. They have worked 6,000 years to get to this moment, and it takes Jesus less than three seconds to put it to rest. In fact, all those years, they, they came with a Luciferian state worldwide. The thing only lasts seven years. 6,000 years is brought down to seven years. Well, you want to talk a whole bunch of work for much of nothing. That's exactly what it is. But there's, there's a witness in heaven. Let, let's pick this up in 1 John chapter 5, verses 5 through 13. You want to overcome this world Babylonian system, you better find out who Jesus is and stay with that. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. What's it talking about here? 
the Holy, who, who's the word? Jesus. There are three that beareth witness in heaven, and it's encoded into the Shema. Shema Israel, Adonai, which is Lord, Eluhenu, which is the single version of Lord, and then again, Elohim. So it's Lord, Lord, Lord is one. It's the perfect witness. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in heaven, and they bear witness. But in the earth, heaven has got to agree with earth. Oh, can I, can I share this? When you start coming into complete agreement with heaven, the power of God will begin resonating through you to be the perfect witness in the earth. In our song services so many times, and this is tradition, I don't care if you're charismatic, Baptist, or everything else, people sing the songs, the church sings the song that people like, the people want to hear. It's going to come a time what we need to do is tune into heaven to make sure that what we're singing on earth is reflecting what they're singing in heaven. And when we do, the same manifestation of the power of God that's in heaven will manifest here. It's the same thing. When I start living this and doing this, while everybody else is doing something else, I am in agreement with heaven. And as I'm in agreement with heaven, that witness will come down and explode within my life. And there are three witnesses in the earth, the Holy Spirit. And the blood and the water that flowed from the sides of Jesus. You see, there is a conspiracy that empowers the Illuminati today. That they believe that they are descendants of Jesus is one of the errors that they have. It's called the Moravigian heresy. You see it in the Da Vinci Code. And that there are those that believe that Jesus faked his death on the cross and that he and Mary Magdalene ran off to France and had children. And those children became the royal families of Europe today. The whole purpose of the Crusades was so that they could get one of their descendants on the throne of David in Jerusalem was the whole purpose of the Crusades. But see, there's one problem with that. You have the spear that pierced his heart. And when it did, it broke the, the sack of water that's around his heart. And with that, with, without that balance there of that, the heart stops. And the blood and the water flowed, and it's still in the earth today, bearing witness that, yes, Jesus is the Son of God. And yes, that Jesus gave his life. He did not fake his life. He did not fake the resurrection. And he did not run off with Mary Magdalene to have children in Europe, that, beca that in France, that became the leading thing. At the end of the movie, The Da Vinci Code, what is it? They find out that the Holy Grail is the blood of Christ re residing in a bloodline. Bull hockey. If that's the case, then you and I are royalty because we have been born into that blood. They haven't, but we have. We have been brought into the royal bloodline of Messiah. And while the 13 Illuminati bloodlines of this world are trying to take the world in and make it a hell itself so that their great despot can come, there is a remnant that have been washed in the blood of Jesus. They know that there is a fountain that flows from Emmanuel's veins, and because of that, I have been adopted into that bloodline, not them. And it is because he did die. He did resurrect three days later, and that tomb is empty to this day. No one has found and said, we have proven the DNA that this corpse, is, these bones are that of Jesus of Nazareth. It is an empty tomb. And the angels gave witness that je same Jesus, that same Jesus that you saw leaving is going to come back. And Jesus said, when I do, every eye will see me. Every eye. The whole world will know. It's not a secret catching away. It's the world comes back and they get their comeuppance because they know he's come. And the wrath of God is carried in his hands. The Bible says, for he comes back, that his vesture or his talit shall be dipped in blood. And he will make this earth a wine press in which he will squeeze out the vengeance of God upon it. You see, it doesn't matter what the world says. It matters what the witness of God says. 
I don't know about you, but I get happy when I read this. People, people read the book of Revelation and say, oh, that is one of the spookiest books. I like sci-fi, and I like action movies. And the ultimate one is not The Expendables Part 3. It is when there is a dimensional portal that opens over this planet and Jesus of Nazareth and the host of heaven come back and he sets up a kingdom and he rules and he reigns for a thousand years and Lucifer himself is thrown into the abyss, is thrown into Tartarus for a thousand years in judgment. And for the first time in human history, absolute harmony, peace, and prosperity is brought to this planet. And you and I get to rule and reign with him, to be part of, part of his administration on planet Earth because we were faithful before he came. That's what I want for you guys, to remain faithful because he who holds out to the end shall be saved. And may God give us the grace to grab onto the zitzi of the Messiah and the reality of his cross and not let go for anything. In Jesus' name. Father, we just thank you for your word today. Father, I thank you that your word will not return to you void. And Father, that word is that Jesus is the Messiah. He is Almighty God, Yahweh Elohim, come in the flesh. That he lived a perfect life before us as an example. That he died. That he stormed the gates of hell and took back the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And that he rose victorious over it. And that he's coming again. Father, let us hold on to the reality of who Jesus is while the whole world labors to blur who he is and to make him into something else. Let us remain faithful. Give us anointing today to hold on to the end and hold on to the word and the old rugged cross. Because we're getting ready to see you finish this thing up, Father. Let us have the strength to be faithful and to walk victorious. In Jesus' name.